السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الأول أعرفكم بنفسي أنا المهندس أحمد صيام رئيس مجلس شعبة الهندسة المعمارية باسمي وباسم مجلس شعبة الهندسة المعمارية ونقابة المهندسين وباسم زملاء المعماريين الأردنيين جميعهم بشرفني أن أرحب فيكم ضيوف الأردن الأعزاء في هذه الأمسية المعمارية الرائعة والتي تمتاز بأمرين جميلين الأول أنها تأتي بالتعاون مع جائزة تميز المعمارية هذه الجائزة التي لها من اسمها كل النصيب وما هذا التعاون إلا تجسيد لانفتاح الشعبة للعمل يدا بيد مع جميع الجهات المختلفة التي تعنى بالعمارة ورعاية المشهد المعماري بشكل عام والسبب الثاني لسعادتنا هذا اليوم هو استضافتنا لمجموعة من المعماريين المتميزين لكل منهم تجربته الخاصة والتي شكلت وما زالت تشكل مصدر للإلهام للآلاف من المعماريين وهنا تحديدا تكمن أهمية تبادل الخبرات المستمر وتسليط الضوء على التجارب الناجحة أينما وجدت ولا يفوتني هنا أن أكرر التهاني لجميع المشاركين في جائزة تميز من فائزين ومتأهلين وعلى رأسهم معلمنا الكبير دكتور راسم بدران الذي ما فتئ يرفع اسم الوطن عاليا في سماء العمارة محليا وعربيا وعالميا وإن شاء الله هو اليوم معنا بس على الطريق شوي متأخر في الختام كل الشكر لأمانة عمان لاستضافتها هذه الأمسية ولكل من ساهم بتنظيمها من كوادر نقابة المهندسين وفريق جائز التميز وأخص بالشكر زميلي وأخي العزيز أسيد العيطان Ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished guests, it's our pleasure to meet you here in Amman during Tamayu's design talks. We wish you had a pleasant stay in Jordan, uh, and we are very happy for this collaboration with Tamayu's uh, award, and we are happy to host this talk, which we are sure that it will be a true inspiration for all of us. Thank you. Usaid Al-Aytan, Mumathil Jaz Tamayu's Bil Urdun. Ahla wa sahla. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ahmed Siam and uh, the Jordanian Engineering Association for this cooperation. Actually, this is what we like to build on here as uh, Tamayus, always to, to build uh, bridges of uh, communication and co collaboration with uh, institutions, local institutions, with academic institutions. And uh, this could be a start for a bigger and more cooperation, which comes uh, with... Uh, benefits for the architectural society. Uh, I'm gonna keep it short today because we have a tight schedule with uh, very enriching speeches uh, and we, kept, we, we, we wanted to keep them tight. So I just would like to ask uh, Ms. Suhail Taqash from uh, Curator at Bergil uh, Foundation to introduce our speakers today, please. Good evening, everyone. I will introduce our four panelists. Uh, the first speaker is um, Rasim Badran. Born in Jerusalem before moving to Jordan, Badran received his bachelor's degree from the University of Technology Darmstadt, Germany in 1969. And in 2002, he received his honorary doctorate from the Jordan University of Science and Technology. He is the founder of his architecture planning and engineering pr practice, Dar al Umran, established in 1980. The practice has grown across the Middle East with offices in Amman, Riyadh, Beirut, and Abu Dhabi. The internationally renowned Palestinian Jordanian architect, Rasa Madran, is the 2019 recipient of the prestigious Tamayus Lifetime Achievement Award for Architecture, the most coveted honor from the Tamayus Excellence Award program. Our second speaker is Shahira Fahmi. Shahira Fahmi is an architect, urbanist, and creative researcher. She's the founder and principal of Shahira Fahmi Architects, which was established in Cairo in 2005. Fahmi has designed and built projects in the Middle East and Europe, and was once hailed by Faden as one of the architects building the Arab future. Her projects include the master plan of An Andermatt Swiss Alps Ski Resort Phase 2 II and 3, the architecture of the Alegria Resort, a housing and residential project in Cairo, and the restoration of an experimental arts hall in New York. Our third panelist is Philip Michael Wolfson. 
After studying architecture at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, American designer and architect Philip Michael Wolfson attended the Architectural Association School of Architecture, where he met Zaha Hadid. After completing his studies, he spent 10 years as head of design with Hadid, and in 1991, he established his own studio. He has worked throughout Europe and the US on residential interiors and functional art pieces, which have been shown at leading international art and design exhibitions, galleries, and public venues all over the world. And our final speaker is Walid Arafa, Egyptian architect and researcher Walid Arafa, founder and principal of his practice Dar Arafa Architecture, speaks to Tamayus about reviving traditional forms of architecture with modern expressions and the role architecture could play in empowering the people of the Middle East. The session will be moderated by Sultan Saud Al Qasimi. Uh, we will now begin with our first panelist. Uh, I would like ask you to all to welcome uh, architect Walid Arafa to present our uh, his speak. Claimer that uh, just for those who uh, who, who uh, are expecting me to give a full description of the project, uh, that this is not going to be the case. I'm just going to um, go through one idea, which uh, this project and most of uh, my work is uh, trying to uh, find out about. So this is about um, a project uh, that started in 2014 in a, in a small village in Upper Egypt, 500 kilometers south uh, to, uh, of Cairo. And this is the, the plot here. It's, uh, it's a village with, with 30,000 people. And uh, this was the old building within this plot over here. There's a graveyard to the right. This is the main street here, 10 meters wide. And then these are residentials that surround it with a semi-private uh, public, sp semi-private uh, space called the Rahaba, which is a space in, um, in, in, in upper Egyptian villages that are surrounded by houses that belong to one family. So they're not accessible to everyone in the village. Only women and children, uh, even who don't uh, belong to these families, but men only from this family. So this is, this is what was on this uh, plot, uh, this main building, uh, which was 70 years old, the mosque itself, with the toilets in front of it. Uh, and the entrance was from next to the toilet, and uh, it had undergone... Uh, uh, two, uh, two, two events which undermined the structural uh, safety of the building. So there was a flash flood that ruined the ceiling. You'll see that through the pictures. And uh, there was also a building that was built just next to it that uh, caused some subsidence in the soil, uh, which uh, resulted in uh, structural cracks that you'll see also through the... But also there were other problems, uh, symbolic problems, uh, which was, for instance, when you're standing to pray, uh, facing the Qibla, what you see is the bathrooms and the toilets are on the main road and other things. So when I was summoned to, uh, um, to look into this problem, I was not necessarily asked to redesign uh, something, although the, the people of the village wanted a new building. But uh, I was asked first to assess the situation and see if this could be conserved. So I actually studied the, the actual building these are pictures from it. I'm going to go fast. You can see the crack here. And then also I um, um, roamed around in the village to, to see the architectural value of this building versus what is there in the village before the 70 years and whether this was a building that had any kind, any kind of significance uh, and needed to, uh, to cut us a long story short. I, I agreed with the people at the end that this, does, this shouldn't be conserved and it was going to be very costly. This is the village. So you, we can see newer buildings here. We can see old buildings here. And we're going to see some examples of the older buildings uh, closer. So, so this actually intersected with what I'm trying to look for in my practice, which is I'm designing today. Uh, but as an Egyptian, uh, what what is the world expecting from me or what is my contribution 
to architecture specifically. And uh, how does this do with the past or what we call tradition or turath? Uh, should we completely forget it? And, uh, or should we imitate it and uh, do a historicist approach? Or should we learn from the past to create a future which continues the discontinued, uh, what might be referred to as Egyptian architecture? So looking in the village itself, I'm, I'm not sure the pictures are clear, but these are, like I, I classified the buildings of the village into three uh, categories according to age, which also uh, proved, um, uh, um, showed some common um, um, properties between them. So anything over 100 years had some uh, design intention quality, although the the materials used are simple, so it's mud bricks mostly, but there is uh, craftsmanship, there is uh, a, a design intention. Here, for instance, you have staggered, it's, it's mud, but one is red, one is white, and there's, there's something being done. There's a pursuit of uh, excellence uh, within the context of the place. And then I bumped into this detail as well, which is turning a corner. You can see it here. It's turning a corner in the street. This building is 300 years old. It's not uh, uh, inhabited now. But then turning the corner with such a lovely detail, that, that was one of the main reasons why I decided, okay, this 70 years old building does not really represent the legacy of the, of the village. So the question, which I was trying to answer all through, and I'm still trying to answer uh, through my practice, is how do you learn from the past? And uh, the point where I am now is that uh, the past or tradition is, um, the way we can learn from it is not to imitate its direct physical products, but the way of thinking, although there might be sometimes uh, elements from the past that are still valid today. So I, I call that valid past. And I'm pointing at this, this is the uh, entrance dome or reimagined past. Another uh, element that is historical, the pendant of dome, but that is reimagined in a different way or future begotten by the past. So we're doing, a, um, innovating a completely new element, but based on principles and uh, ways that are time honored. So uh, just to describe the project uh, fast, uh, again, this is the street, this is the cemetery here, this is the Rahaba, and the dark uh, uh, is, uh, are the residential buildings. Uh, uh, so we had a few entrances. Uh, the main entrance is from this side, from the southeast, uh, through the entrance dome and into the main prayer hall. There's another entrance from the back for men and women. There was no mosque before that uh, was designed to entertain the presence of women. Um, and then we, uh, we created um, three levels. So the lower ground floor, so you come in from the main entrance, you come down from the stairs to uh, do your ablution. The toilets are here, but, but outside of the uh, axis of the Qibla. Uh, there's an, another entrance from the back through these stairs to this space and this space. Uh, was designed to um, entertain the bigger numbers of worshippers during Ramadan and the Friday prayers. But uh, through the rest of the year, it's an open plan, so it can be divided into uh, smaller uh, spaces to entertain other non-religious uh, activities that can welcome Muslims and non-Muslims alike, like tuition or um, medical services and so on. So this is the lower ground floor. And then this is the ground floor. So you come in from here through the main en uh, through the entrance dome into this hall. This is the mahrab here, and this is how the uh, imam gets into uh, the member. And then the mezzanine, which is a level f exclusively for women, but women can go on the uh, ground floor as well. But we leave that for their choice because there's differences in their culture. Like older women don't mind. Uh, mixing, but uh, the younger ones uh, wouldn't be much uh, comfortable uh, within that context. 
And then uh, also there was, th this is an allusion to the solution uh, that really defined the character of the building because th as you see the narrow street that is 10 meters wide um, uh, in, brought in so much noise and dust and, um, and smell from cattle passing by and so on. Uh, but of course we need openings in any building to uh, allow in fresh air and uh, natural light. Uh, but I, want, I, I thought, okay, I can't do openings uh, on the, on the out, um, outer skin of the building. So I resorted to uh, doing all of that from the roof. So the roof was divided uh, by these beams here, which gave us 108 small squares and this big, big square for uh, the dome. This is the uh, southern facade. <clears throat> Western facade, or then uh, this is the one uh, that you can see from the Rahaba, and this is the eastern facade which is adjacent to the cemetery, and this is the only window in the building, and this serves uh, to, to uh, a symbolic function, so when you go into the building uh, from the main entrance, uh, this is the window that you see, and you see the cemetery. And this is very. This is. This was my architectural expression of what the imam usually say when he says, "Pray as if this is your last prayer." So this was my reminder. In addition to the fact, of course, that the cemetery is a quiet place, so it was a buffer. It did not have the same uh, problem uh, like if I opened windows in the rest of the walls of the building. So uh, my example for what I called the valid past is the entrance dome, which was inspired by the, uh, or it is actually uh, with uh, little modification, uh, the uh, one of the domes of the Cor uh, Cortoba Grand Mosque. Uh, but just uh, here you can see that the these um, intersecting arches are uh, semicircular, uh, whereas the other one is five pointed, the one I did, because I thought it is more uh, indigenous to Egypt. And here's uh, Dr. Abdel Halim Ibrahim's uh, entrance to the American University in Cairo, and he used the same uh, um, dome, but he didn't cover it, and I think he was sending us certain messages. So this is uh, what I did here. I played a little bit, so I changed the arch, and I played a little bit with the uh, transparency and opacity, so these elements here, these repetitive elements, became, uh, were made of glass, but all, all of this was opaque. We'll see the construction now. And then the second um, approach, which is the reimagined uh, past, uh, can be shown through the pendant of domes uh, tessellation, which was covering the roof. So each one of the 108 squares were divided into two triangles. One is opaque, which is covered with the pendant of dome, which follows generally, not exactly accurately, but the solar path. And then this part here, uh, the other triangle is transparent. And then there's a vertical panel of, of glass, which is, has a circular opening. Uh, it, it doesn't show here, but it will show in the pictures, to allow uh, uh, natural ventilation, which is also the, the whole uh, orientation works for all, all of the above. So the wind, uh, uh, the nice breeze comes from the uh, wet, uh, northwest and north and northeast. So this was the idea for the ventilation. And then the solar studies. And then harvesting. Water is a rare occurrence, but when it happens, it's really a lot. So I thought also instead of just putting, placing all my bats on insulation, all of that, I thought also the beams uh, with a certain detail uh, can take up the water and store it for uh, simple purposes like irrigating the plants and uh, just cleaning the outdoors areas. 
And this is uh, us going through construction. Of course, there are other reasons as well for choosing to build this way, but uh, I'm focusing on this main idea for now. And then the third thing is future begotten by the past, and this is in the central dome. So uh, um, because of other things, I mean, there's no time to explain this, but I, I arrived at this, I had been building simpler domes uh, in the 10 years before that, and I wanted to try uh, something uh, particular, and, and uh, this is not something that is built, uh, uh, like the craft, uh, uh, craftsmen don't do something that is staggered on the inside and the outside. So I had to devise um, a, a guide so that each one of the blocks here used could be defined in the X, Y, and Z without, uh, without and uh, guaranteeing the accuracy. This is it in reality. And of course it was assembled and deassembled. So this is, we were just testing the whole thing, but uh, we, took it up uh, on the top of the mosque uh, component by component and then assembled what we needed because we didn't need all of them at the same time. And this is one eighth of the dome and it rotates and we uh, build the whole thing. We tested everything in the computer first, just simple uh, 3D Max and uh, AutoCAD uh, 3D. So 35 courses. Uh, and each of these blocks, they uh, maintain their dimensions uh, except the third dimension. So we start here from the width, which is 20, and we end up there at 5. But then the other dimension is 38 and uh, 10. And the blocks were solid, so I had to also, in addition to a cutting list, I had to do a drilling uh, list to ensure uh, vertical um, uh, cohere co co cohesiveness uh, so as to uh, guarantee the, the position of each block even after I move on before the uh, bonding material uh, became as strong as it should be. and then testing the whole scheme uh, for light, for natural light. So this was uh, done uh, based on the coordinates of the mosque on the lowest uh, day of the sun, the 21st of December, uh, just one hour before sunset. It's a, that, that's a render, but then we have not real pictures that show uh, whether our assumptions were right or not. These are just the cutting and drilling lists and also the line of staggering here. So we have, in every one, we have a triangle jutting out, uh, whether on the inwards or the outwards. And these are the pictures of the construction. This, these were taken, I took the, these from the minaret, which is 28 meters high, looking down. You can see the guide here as it goes round. complete. So uh, these were three examples. There are other things in the project that uh, are trying to do the same thing, but I chose only three examples because of time. And then this is the complete, these are the images of the completed project. This is an image, uh, this is how you can see it from the main street.
going under the entrance dome. Of course, the mehrab, but that's another story, it, it follows something called the cube of cubes, and this is where all the proportion system of the mosque uh, came about. Also the minaret. That was on the uh, 21st of uh, Ju uh, June. That's during Friday prayers. at night. That's it. Thank you very much. So I have two presentations. Uh, one is uh, 20 slides and then one longer. I'll take you through uh, my projects very briefly, what, what I've been working on and uh, different things. Uh, I'm not gonna explain one project in particular, though I enjoy it very much for lead uh, presentation. So um, I work on different scales. Uh, since I started, I worked uh, from home and I worked on uh, product design and uh, things that I can manage alone and on my own and enter competitions while I was pregnant with my daughter. And um, so I work in scales like product design. This was a design uh, pollution mask designed for the UN. And then I work on master plan as well. Uh, this project was in 2011. It was a competition in Andermatt the last phase of Andermatt, and um, our scope of work was this zone, which is the last land that this project had, and it was in front of a train station. And just to give a brief um, intro about this, that um, Andermatt is in actually the heart of Switzerland, in a canton called Uri, and it used to be this um, location where the train station is, is actually um, uh, above the Gerthard Pass, and this was connecting uh, south, north to south of Europe, west to east of Europe. So it, it had an historical uh, importance, and it was also a military base. Um, sorry that my, um, it's too loud and too low. Okay, I'll move to other things. So. I've worked in different scales, as I mentioned, from product to master planning, and also I had a lot of in-betweens between those two scales, from projects that went into completion, from projects that stopped into completions with 2011 uh, Arab uprising and revolution. So I had like, um, uh, this was a project that I was designing, and it's still in that red brick, and we started that project in 2005, and still, till today, it's not finished yet. But I guess this is part of architecture. Most of 
how I work is I start from what is uh, being given. So uh, here is a project in Upper Egypt um, in, uh, in a very remote village um, uh, connected to the Asyut governorate, but really in the south of Asyut. And this was, I brought this project in because and I've never shared it a lot with many people and it's one of my earliest uh, projects. And, um, and the way I work on this one is actually how I work on other projects. So I start with, um, usually with uh, this piece of land is 15 by 20 meters. And it was a very ambitious project to host a culture center, a library, um, a theater, and a cinema for that village. The village is called the Weir. Um, this is the end product at the time. I have to say this was in 99, and this was one of my first projects, and I was very uh, much influenced by the work of Dr. Rasim Badran and Dr. Abd Halim Ibrahim. And I was so much immersed in their work, uh, you know, following everything. So I wanted to experiment if I can f do something with all I've learned and also struggling as an architect, what should I do with the past? And should I ignore it or try to do something with it? Or should I just be in the present? Um, so this is, uh, this is actually a mal'af that uh, generates air to the whole project and there is a tiny courtyard in the, in the middle. This is the plan, this is a courtyard where, and the Malaf is here, which act, acts as the landmark, the bearing of the project and also the entrance that leads you in a playful courtyard inside and then leads you to different spaces. Theater here, a library in that direction. We had a cafe to make it open to the street level and attract people to come in. And at the end, rooftop, we had an amphitheater. And this is the internal space of it. And this was open in 2013. From 99 to, it took 12 to 13 years to get this project on the ground. Um, I think architecture was one of the professions that teaches you to be patient. Uh, this is a, uh, sorry. This is the layout of it, and this is the village where it's uh, immersed in. And then I'll take you to another project, which is uh, very recent, one of my recent uh, constructed projects. It's in um, London. So in London, I got invited to, to a competition of a culture center as well and an art foundation, and. Um, a lot of the principles that I've used from the start of the Ahmed Bahaeddin Center, I never really mentioned the Upper Egypt um, Culture Center is Ahmed Bahaeddin, um, following the writer, and it was a piece of land that the family of Ahmed Bahaeddin owned. And um, a lot of my work um, came from studies that I've done uh, with Dr. Abdul Haim Ibrahim on Islamic architecture and how. Um, a lot of the work goes in, in between. We have something between the in and outside and how this in between layer that governs what's out and what's in, what's yours and what's not yours. And a lot of my projects have this thread of in between spaces, um, that grayscale zone that nobody can define if it's in or out. Uh, this is the in-between spaces after they're created. Delfina has opened its door to the public in 2014. Um, I was collaborating uh, on this project with a UK-based design firm. Um, this is one of my built, I, I brought this because I wanted to um, mention some of the built projects uh, are now uh, being published in um, a book, uh, Cairo Guide. It's a Cairo since 1900 uh, by Mohammed Shahid and uh, AUC Press. And uh, it's just uh, being uh, online for sale like uh, this week. And I'm uh, very proud to have two projects in that book. Uh, one is Designopolis which is uh, the first design center in Egypt 
that hosts all design trades and anything related to design. And then uh, one of my earliest projects as well, which is a residential house uh, near the pyramids. Um, I'm very proud to be in that book because it uh, actually archives from Cairo since 1900 till today. Most of the buildings that have been built by a lot of great architects and uh, I'm glad I'm, I'm included. Um, this is a house. Um, a lot of my projects are in that status, especially the residential private ones in Egypt. Because also, you know, after the 2011, um, a lot of people didn't want to continue. Um, I had many, um, I want to steal that word from Bernard Khoury, who has a, a book called Local Heroes. And uh, heroes are the clients, the clients that come to you and are allowing you to experiment with them. And this experimentation is always costing money to just uh, open the door and say, okay, build me a house and I'm gonna be open to your ideas. And we, and it takes years until you understand the client, what they need and what can you do. And um, most of my projects are because of heroes, of people who had open, uh, you know, their minds uh, for experimentation. And this is one of them. Uh, um, I don't know how to explain the work, but a lot of the work I do um, is actually, I always, as I mentioned, I start with the land or what's given. And this piece of land was a rectangle piece of land. I cannot, sorry, that's very confusing. <laughs> anyway, uh, maybe in a later project I'll explain. That's another house, another hero, another client uh, was open for... Um, for me to design and, and work in collaboration with them. That one project is finished uh, on Al Alamein uh, beach, um, west of Alexandria. Uh, it's a very, uh, like, uh, one floor house. Um, a lot of courtyards. I, I usually tend to have courtyards, not as a rule, but as, as the in-between again. Where do, where is in, where is out, and how comfortable humans to be living um, in the gray zones more than others, uh, more than the defined. And as I'm working and observing, I find that human beings like not the very defined uh, spaces, but like the zones that are translucent between both. Um, that's actually me walking inside the space. Um, of, of the same house. This is the Zynopolis again. And this is just a sample to show some of the more urban scale projects. Uh, one of my earliest work was interior design, uh, uh, the interior design of the theater in American University in Cairo uh, for Dr. Abdel Halim Ibrahim, who was the prime architect and the architect of this building. And then again, product design, uh, as I always, um, it was always for me a place where I can work and I don't have the client. And sometimes you need to have no client and just work without the other consultants, the MEP, the electromechanical, the construction, the structure, and everyone else. And you just uh, play a bit, but again, it has a lot of architecture within it. Um, this is also a competition of a teacup that I did. And some of these products are for brands. Later on, brands took them over and had them. And then uh, one of the best things is when you see people inhabiting your spaces. And when you have, um, uh, when you see the users inside your space. Um, this is also to show how in our office we tend to do a lot of models, a lot of studies. Even if the clients will never see them or they're not interested, we just have to do it as a process of the work. Um, and then I'll take you to maybe another, because I think I have more time <laughs> on my hands. I'll show you another presentation 
which might delve more into details into some of the projects. I did that, um, okay. This was our headquarter in Cairo. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, um, that I'm moving to London. This no longer exists. Uh, this is the Andermatt uh, project again, just to give you some of the, where it is in terms of uh, location. This is our you know, zone of the competition. And then this is our actually proposal, but the proposal was, uh, of course, drawn and also modeled into a real model. Um, and one of the things that I didn't know, or you know, I, I was a bit like, um, in in Switzerland, any competition, the mayor, the the public, the people who lives in the village, come into uh, the competition. They are part of the jury. Uh, they have a lot to say. Um, here are some of the studies of how we went into wanting to make that plot of land a connector between the old village and a new development resort that has been done here. And how we want to create that the, this piece of land is a connector to both and also an entertainment and, and, a, and a nice walk and path that leads to both. This is some of my sketches, early sketches. Part of this brief was to build actually a density closer to this. Then I decided I, I can't really because the densities around us was really high that I wanted this project to be a park. So I defied the brief and I did something different. And with my team in the office, we started like doing all the built things under the garden. And, and whatever we see above the garden has to be very minimal. And uh, we won the first prize for this competition, though we were not actually abide by the brief because we thought that the brief was too much of a density to the village. And it was a risk, but then you learn that you have to take risks and you have to you know, do what you feel about um, what should be done in the land. Because sometimes the client wants you to tell them what, what, what's possible and what's not possible. Uh, Alegria was a big project uh, that I participated in this piece. The, the master plan was already built, and I, part of my work was to design the prototypes, but it was already there. But I'm, I think I want to skip that project. <laughs> it's not one of my favorites. <laughs> but I'll go, I'll, I have actually three minutes. <laughs> I'll skip a bit, that's Delfina. Too quick. <laughs> I have only one minute now that I'm wasting the time of just going through. Okay, maybe I'll talk about this one for one minute. Just uh, okay. Um, from the Ahmed Bahaeddin project, where it had a, a small boundary white uh, brick wall, uh, I learned a lot. I learned that you start with the plot. And that plot, um, a lot of the process of design, how I work, and I start in a, putting a boundary about, uh, around the, uh, the plot and then carving it out. I have a, a lot of my work is about subtraction, about um, taking out things, eliminating things more than add adding things. Uh, and I think that's it. Let's stop at... Uh <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Philip Michael Wolfson. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to be discussing um, my involvement with Zaha, some of the early works that we did, some of my works, and um, I'm starting with a painting and I'm going to end with a painting. Um, in the late 1970s, there was a moment when architecture was ready for a change, and you had a lot of people that were looking at different ways to approach um, architecture. Uh, one of the paths that Zaha looked at was how architecture uh, could be influenced by paintings and by movements. 
and she took very closely a, a, an examination of Russian constructivism. Uh, this is a painting by Malevich, and this was uh, Zaha's, Zaha's painting uh, that was done her, her final project, which was uh, called a Malevich Tecton. I was a student at the Architectural Association at that time, and um, this is the sort of work that was influencing me very much, uh, because her works were being published by the late 70s. Um, this is the, um, the um, uh, project of the um, bridge over the Thames. Uh, this was one of the works that Zaha did with the Office of Metropolitan Architecture, which was Ram Koolhaas's office at the time. Ram Koolhaas and Elias and Gallus were also tutors at the Architectural Association uh, in those days. Um, Zaha worked with uh, Ram at uh, the Office of Metropolitan Architecture for one year before setting up her own practice. And in 1981, um, she, she did that. She had a couple of people working with her, and they did two projects. They did a proposal, a competition, actually, for the Irish Prime Minister's house. This was in 1981. And this is a sketch that Zaha did for that. And you can see how it so strongly relates to uh, constructivism, the paintings that were done at the time. This was the actual project. Um, for, the, for the Irish Prime Minister's house in an ink drawing and then in a painting. She used paintings you know, back then, as did other architects at the time. This was the other project going on in her office, which was a pro project for her brother's house in Eaton Square. Again, um, it was a proposal that wasn't done, but the way she examined the site was quite interesting, and the way she created these drawings and paintings um, were very influential to me and to a lot of other people. Um, if you look at this sort of worm's eye view of the bathroom, it becomes quite interesting. So around the same time, I was in my last year at the Architectural Association, and so obviously you can see the influence in my works. Uh, Zaha asked me to work with her when I graduated, and in 1982, um, I, the people that were in her office uh, left, and her office, I should mention, was her muse house. It was a tiny one up, one down. So I went in there, and there was one other student from my class that uh, joined as well. And that summer, we worked on the peak competition, which was, at the time, um, one of the most prominent architectural competitions in the world. It was for a private club on the top of the peak in Hong Kong. Zaha's proposal, which... Um, you architects might know one, uh, but was never built, uh, was about a series of horizontal uh, beams hitting the mountain. It was basically uh, horizontal skyscrapers. And you can see that in the section here, preliminary section, sketch section. This is the model, one of the many models that we did. There were a series of beams with a public sort of public void in the uh, middle. Now that void wasn't necessarily open to the public to use, but it was open in, in the sense that when you're driving on the road, you could actually see it. So the view through to the city was kept open. Um, there were amenities, the club amenities, the library, the uh, restaurant were in, as um, objects within the middle of the void. And then there were apartments in the beams above and below. The very top beam was the promoter's penthouse a view from below the entrance ramp. You ramped into the building. Uh, this is a view of the library and one of the beams which became a swimming pool. This is again the, looking at the changing rooms along the edge of the swimming pool beam. Uh, view from the library over the landscape. And of course the landscape wasn't just rocks like that. It was all built because you're at the top of the peak in Hong Kong. Uh, this is the promoter's pool at the very top and uh, the view from the, from the pool that sort of exploded. Um, this was one of the large uh, images. So the peak competition was won uh, in 1982, and um, it got a lot of attention. Uh, the Architectural Association invited Zaha to basically have an exhibition, and that's where a lot of the larger paintings were done. Uh, Zaha went over to Hong Kong to meet the developers, and that's when they... Um, Margaret Thatcher also went over and pointed out to the Hong Kong people that they were going to become Chinese again. So the economy completely dropped and uh, this developer, along with many others, lost all their money. 
that the project never happened. It's another view. Uh, this is a, one of the views that I particularly like. It's representative of a lot of the ways that architecture was being looked at in the late 70s and early 80s, where paintings became a way of conveying ideas or just examining shapes and forms. This was a, a view called the divers. And I'm just switching to the, to the present. Um, when Zaha passed, I, I did a little collage here. At the bottom part is actually the painting of the divers from the peak competition, and then the top view is the swimming pool in London, which was designed and built by Zaha and completed for the Olympics. Um, when it opened, Zaha had a party there, and they had a group of synchronized divers uh, performing for us, which was a lot of fun. Uh, this is the Peak Project, uh, the, one of the most important paintings that was done for the project. It's about three meters high. And it's an overview of all of, of Hong Kong. Um, if this works, which it doesn't on my machine, okay. Uh, I'll give it one more try. Nope, okay. So at the very top of the painting, you can see the Peak Project, uh, uh, right up at the top. And then at the very bottom, we overlaid the floor plans on a series of imaginary, imaginary um, slabs, architectural slabs. Now, that wasn't computer generated. This is before the computer era. So what we did was, um, the draw, it was a drawing, the painting began as, a, as, a, as an ink drawing. Um, then the process of making the painting was that we then had to have a copy of that drawing made and we put that copy of the drawing with blue tracing paper underneath it over a stretched piece of watercolor paper and um, retraced the whole image and then it was painted. These are studies uh, color studies that were done, small color studies, to examine the, the, the sort of imagery that Zaha wanted to achieve. Um, the, the abstractions that she was doing, if you know her work, a lot of these sketchbooks that you might see at exhibitions show a lot of loose doodles and sketches, but they all had a certain meaning, I think, for Zaha. Sometimes she'd be thinking about what might have been a form that was representative of a detail of a project, um, or sometimes just not at all, as a way of relaxing. There's a large abstract painting that was done. This is a small sketch study. And this is actually a study for the uh, Kerfurstendam um, project, uh, which was a social housing, uh, sorry, the, the Kudam project was a developer's uh, building, a small building on a very ridiculous site. It was three meters wide by about seven meters long on a corner. And um, it was really all about a facade over an elevated ground floor plane. So like the peak had that open entrance area so you could actually see the view, the idea behind the Kudam project, the Kristin Dam project, was that the, you, you, again, you had an elevated ground floor which allowed public to get a glimpse of what might be going on further up the building. This is a sort of a, a sketch study of the facade that um, late at night Zaha got playful and made it into a sort of a self-portrait. Um, this is the actual building, the final designs of the building, which again didn't happen. The developer got scared, didn't think it could happen, but all of the projects would have been possible. We worked with OVR's uh, engineers right from the very beginning. One of the first projects that was done was an interiors project done in the uh, mid 80s, 85, 86. It was a private uh, residence and it was the main living room floor, which was a raised, uh, raised first floor. And we designed a series of furniture and sort of an installation wall for that project. Uh, you, you're looking down at one of the sofas, the two that were designed, coffee table, uh, the spermatoid coffee table. This is one of the wave sofas and the wall-mounted back platform. It's a cast bronze detail of the coffee table. This is a sketch, uh, sketches that Zaha did, little teeny post-its um, for one of the sofas, and that's one of the sofas. Uh, this, these pieces became the basis for the first furniture collection, uh, which was produced by Edra in Italy. So by the mid-80s, there was a big exhibition called, about deconstructivist architecture at MoMA in New York, and that really set the, um, the, the, the groundwork for a number of architects, Frank Gehry, um, Elias and Gallus, Ram Koolhaas, they were all now becoming you know, builders of architecture and projects. Uh, we were working on furniture, we were working on plate designs. This was a series of uh, plates done for a company in New York called Swid Powell. 
And the next year, there was a project in Sapporo, um, the restaurant Munsoon, uh, which was, again, a t it was a, an interiors project, uh, two floors. And it was about fire and ice. And the, f the upper level was fire, the lower level was ice. This is a little abstract sketch study. And I was just actually told today um, that that might be um, uh, Arabic um, calligraphy for hello. I don't know if any of you can confirm that or not. And, and so that was surprising. And I have another sketch of Zaha's um, that, um, that I've just given to a museum that um, we just found out had my name on it. So it was rather amusing. I always thought it was just a beautiful line work. I'm personally very interested in calligraphy, whether it's Chinese, um, Arabic, whether it's um, early writing forms. Uh, this is the lower level of the restaurant ice. Uh, but we were much more excited about the, the fire side, um, which was um, just had a lot of sort of movement forms in it, had a series of furniture pieces with drop-in drop uh, sofa elements and uh, sort of hibachi and sort of tables. So that, anyway, that was the first uh, interior that was done. This was now the basis of the first project, uh, which was the, actually before Vitra, um, this was the social housing project in Berlin, uh, which we started in the late uh, 80s. And it was on a site, the red line, can you see the red line? I don't know if you can see it. Um, the, the, the faint red line is the, is the wall that separated East and West Berlin. And our site <coughs> was a wedge-shaped site. Um, as it was a social housing project, of course, the costs were rather limited. But this was really an interesting um, series of international architects who did different um, housing projects in Berlin. So this is the ground plan. And the project was basically a tower and a long beam, uh, the tower being raised. Uh, this is uh, floor, initial floor plans uh, in the tower. Uh, this is a sketch study looking from the rear, sort of along the road. You see the long beam. Uh, the ground condition there contained shops. Uh, this is an early sketch showing the tower, uh, and then the circulation entrance, a more finalized painting that, again, represents the project, and this is the completed project. So it's interesting that the actually, you know, the completion wasn't that far off from the um, sketches we were doing. So after this project, I set up on my own practice. And of course, you know, I'd gone to Zaha right after university. I'd been one of her students. So my work was very influenced by that. I started my own practice doing what I call functional sculpture. Um, and I don't use the word design because I think that um, design requires other aspects of importance before you get to um, uh, to, in order to be called design. Uh, and, and my works start with conceptual ideas. This was the first of the origami series. This is the origami chair, uh, the shadow of the origami chair. And um, a few years back, I, there was a dancer choreography that took the piece to the Rambert Studios in London, and we made a film of him dancing. His own work responds very much to movement, inherent motion. That was, the, the origami chair was done originally in 91. I've been doing origami pieces in various materials since then. And the latest series we've been doing are purely sculptural, and they're called Origami Dancer. And they're a series of eight movements based on dance movements. Um, that's um, basically starting from the lower levels. Uh, we've done a few of the um, steps or movements. Uh, this was done um, in Miami for Art Basel. That's the piece there. Uh, again, you're going up to the last step. And we did that um, a few years ago in uh, mirror polished stainless steel. One of the things that you know, I learned from Zaha was that scale is something in the mind of the beholder. Um, something that could be a sort of vase on a table could also become a skyscraper, um, depending on site conditions and everything else. But there was an idea that scale could be played with. This is um, Dancer 5. Another of the series of pieces that I'm working on is called the Line Series. It's about the movement of a drawn line. And this is the uh, sideline, uh, desk, coffee table. It was made in carbon fiber because there wasn't any way you could do it otherwise. 
Um, another series is called Sound Forms. They're pieces that are based on the movement of a sound wave. And this is the sound form uh, that was done for um, China. It was um, a request to do a piece for the launch of Glen Morangi in the Far East. And so this is based on the sound wave that's generated when you pour liquid into a crystal glass. Uh, this is sound form, I call it sound form concrete. Uh, and then this is a series called Sound Notes. These are sculptures. It's one work that can be used in different directions. If it's in the, in the view on the right, uh, you can actually sit on it, whereas on the left, it becomes more of a sculptural element. Liquid Genesis, again, was done. Sorry? Is, am I out of time? Oh, fine. <laughs> A liquid, liquid Genesis was another uh, piece that was commissioned by Glenn Morangy. And uh, then the last of the sculptural pieces that I'm going to show is a series that we're just starting, which is called uh, Vortex DNA. I'm also doing painting. Uh, obviously, when I was working with Zaha, I was pretty much kept doing the drawing work. Uh, she had a whole team of painters that worked with her. Um, um, but I did get to, you know, obviously in university I did painting, and I would do some competitions and do paintings, but the last few years I've started doing um, more abstract paintings, not based on architectural projects. This is a series called Transitional Geometries, and it's a mix of a computer-generated vortex, and then it's printed in ink, and then I apply, further apply ink lines and acrylic paint on it. Um, we've done a lot of those. They've been exhibited. Um, and then the last of the series, the current series I'm working on, uh, these are called Tools of Inception. Uh, these are large paintings in ink and acrylic. Uh, and, that's, and that's what I'm doing these days. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> جائزة تميز المعمارية أو جائزة تميزية المعمار هذه هذه يعني تهزتو أحب أذكر سريعا أن أنا أن أنا نشأت في بيت اعتنى بالفنون والإبداع الفني من خلال المرحوم والدي جمال بدران لا سوري بدأت أتعامل مع التعبير المرئي منذ أربع لما كان عمري أربع سنوات هذه أربع سنوات هذه ست سنوات لما تعلمت البرسبكتيف فوجدت أمامي العالم صار بيدي يعني صرت أعبر عنه بتعبير صريح حياة المدينة لما كان عمري ثمان سنوات كنت أنظر للشيء ثم أعود البيت وأرسم من الذاكرة أنا كان اهتمامي كله حول الإبداع الصناعي يعني هذا كان الشيء اللي همني في كل مساري عندما كنت عم عم بنمو من يعني من أربع سنوات إلى قبل دخول الجامعة يعني في سن متأخر قبل يمكن بسن 16 سنة دخلت بالتفاصيل هذه حوامة صممتها ودخلت بكل تفاصيلها مع مع ترقيم لكل جزء ماذا يعني وكان في قائمة طبعا مش 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 على أرضها بس كانت فعلا كنت أرجع من تجارب حتى عملية حل على الحوامات يعني أو مثلا أبراج ال ال تطق الصواريخ يعني هذا كان جزء من من اهتمامي كما ذكرت لما قبل ما ما أنهي المدرسة الثانوية أثناء ترحال مع الوالد ومع العائلة لأوروبا كنت أهتم بتطور القاطرات هذه في روما في فارق يمكن ثلاث سنوات بين اللوحة هذه واللوحة اللي تحتها كنت أهتم بالتفاصيل الدقيقة وكما كما قلت أرسمها من الذاكرة أراها ثم عندما أعود إلى إلى حيث سكن أحد بطرابلس الغرب ليبيا أثناء العهد السنوسي أبدأ أعمل يعني أكرس وقتي لكي يعبر عن ما رأيته من التخزين الذي خزنته في عقلي الطائرة كانت مثل لي هو هو هذا الشيء المبهر يعني اعتبرت هذا هذا هو الإبداع الصناعي الإبداع العلمي 
طبعا في فارق في السنوات هذا عندنا مكان عمري ست سنوات ست سنوات هنا مثلا ثمان سنوات ثم عندما وصل عمري الى 16 سنه هذا كله من الخيال يعني عم بحاول ارسم الشيء كيف يبنى بادق التفاصيل هذا كان عالمي يعني لم لم اكن افكر ان اكون معماري اصلا كنت افكر اكون ادخل في 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 التكوين الصناعي في في الابداع الصناعي في التصميم الصناعي هذا قبل سنتين يعني حتى الايرباص مره تكلموا معي انه هل ممكن تعمل شيء يعني بس ما قدرنا نتواصل بهذه الامور عم بفكر بس كيف اتعامل مع انسيابيه الشكل يمكن يوم ما اتحول لتصميم طائرات مش الاعمار يعني هذه يمكن تكون مع <تصفيق> بس مع ذلك حعيش بالغرب مش عايش بالعالم العربي هذا كمان النقطه اللي كانت تقلقني دائما ان ابحث عن 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 مهنه يعني تشدني الى ارضي مش ابحث عن مهنه اهاجر فيها ثم انسى عالمي العربي هذه هنا طبعا دخلنا في مرحله لما بدات ادرس عماره في الجامعه كانت فتره الثوره الطلابيه ايضا كنا نحن ضد النظام الكلاسيكي النظام اللي في ملل في وفي رتابه في التعليم فهذه كانت احدى مشاريعي المسرح الحديث سنة 68 وهنا نجد مجموعة من المشاريع هذا مطار عمان الدولي هذا كان هذه المشروع اللي بني في ميونخ اطرق له هلا وهذا مشروع تخرجي بالكويت نشر في مجلة فرنسية اسمها اي اي مش عارف اذا بتعرفوها اشتو جدوي وهذه المسرح الحديث هو كان نقطة تحول في في تفكيري انا ابحث عن مسرح اجتماعي وليس مسرح مغلق هذه بعض تفاصيل هذا المسرح هو عبارة عن لونا بارك يعني أقرب لمدينة ملاهي تتحول إلى مسرح وتبنى من خلال الحلقات التي تنفخ بنوميتك ستركشر هي الحلقات التي تنفخ بالهواء ونشر في كتاب معروف مع مؤلفين للموسيقى الأفانغارد ميوزيك أو الموسيقى المستقبلية زي جورج لاجيتي زي موريس كاجل هذه كانت من الأهم هون إحنا خرجنا عن إطار الأكاديمية دخلنا في 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 الحياة المتفاعلة مع الإنسان بالفنون المستقبلية هذا كان أحد أعمالي هذا مشروع تخرجي بالكويت وهذا كمان أخذت عليه يعني كانت كله تقنية المدينة المناخية يمكن ذروة هذه الفترة عندما دعيت مع مجموعة من الألمان أن نصمم بعض القطع لخدمة ملاعب الأولمبيك المركز الأولمبي في ميونخ سنة 69 إلى 72 دخلنا في صناعة المعادن وصنعة مصنع طائرات هذا كمان الجميل أنه يعني تعود الطائرة إلى 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 لا وعي لا مدرك أنه هذه أعمال صنعت أول عمل عملته في ألمانيا صنعة مصنع طائرات اللي هو هذا طبعا هذه مجموعة مقاصف مجموعة مراكز يمكن عدد عشرين مركز منتشر في جميع أرضية الملعب يعني اعتبرت جزء من التراث العالمي هلا حفظت ورممت وانا بعتبرها زي كانها غواصه قديمه كيف الغواصه تعيد تعيد تصليحها فكان موقف جميل ترى الشيء هذا يعاد يعاد تصليحه وترميمه دعيت من شركه دورما الالمانيه ودعوا هينينغ لارسن وجون نوفيل نعمل دراسات عن ايد الابواب فكنا نحن هذا العرض اللي قدمته لدورما بس ما صار في شيء وراه بس كانت هيك حلم انه كيف تبحث عن ايد الباب. كلها إلى علاقه بما يسمى تصميم الصناعي. عدت الى عمان عدت الى الى ما يسمى الثقافه الانسانيه، افكر بالانسان، افكر بتفاصيل يعني تفاصيل دقيقه لما خلق الله. ادخل بالاعشاب، يعني هي هي عباره عن زي فترة ما يسمى أن أخرج من الصناعة أخرج من العمارة وأفكر بالطبيعة ثم بدأ عندي الموقف الصعب عندما دعيت بالسبعينات تصميم كانت مسابقة تصميم جامع الملك عبد الله الأول مرحوم هذه كانت مسابقة هنا أنا كنت في حيرة يعني لم لم أكن أنا أتيت من الغرب من ثقافة صناعية متطورة كيف أنظر للجامع وما هو الجامع 
فالشيء الذي شدني هو المقرنص من خلال شغل والدي بالزخارف الإسلامية سوري كان المقرنص هو الشيء الذي يعني شد انتباهي فحاولت أن يعني أقول أن المقرنص هذا الجزء الإبداعي في الجيومتري في في عمارة المسلمين هي الانتقالات من المربع إلى المثمن إلى الدائري فحولت أنا إلى 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 منبع للإنارة في في المسجد وهذه المسابقة كان مفروض أنا والمعمار رفعت الجدرجي أن نتعاون سويا في في تصميمها لكن حصل أن رفعت تعرض إلى ظرف منعه من أن يتعامل أن يعمل المهنة يتعامل مع المهنة فأنا أكملت هذا المشروع وقدمته لكن للأسف لم يختار وتم اختيار المشروع الحالي اللي هو في العبدلي <تصفيق> هذا المشروع طبعا رفعت كان مهتم انه يدخلني في مجال ان ان اطور فكره المسجد فدعاني لمسابقه عالميه لتصميم جامع الدوله الكبير في بغداد واعتقد هذه كانت نقطه تحول في حياتي يعني كانت تعتبر هذه اهم نقطه كيف انظر الى الى هذا البناء الروحي او او المدينه او او البناء المتفاعل مع الانسان في اطار المادي واللا مادي انه ما هو هذا المسجد وكيف انظر لهذا المسجد؟ فهنا بدات رحلتي مع ما يسمى عماره المجتمع الاسلامي، لكن انا يعني يمكن الناس وصفوني انا انا خبير في العمارة الاسلاميه، لا انا انا مصمم اصمم البيئه. وهذه يمكن شوي ظلمتني في 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 اول بدايات مهنتي. ف اوكي بدات في هذا الجامع كانت هناك بعض مل... بعض هيك سميها التقاط بعض الملاحظات انه المسجد مرتبط مع مع هذا المجد النبوي مرتبط مع بيئته العمرانيه هو عباره عن نسيج متفاعل وليس صرح منفرد او او معزول اهتميت في موضوع التكييف الهواء او او الابراج الهواء في توب كابي هي عباره عن رصد جمع خلينا نسميها نقاط اثرت في عندما ابدا قبل ان ابدا بالتصميم اتذكر هذه هذه المواضيع ذهبت الى الى بغداد واجريت رحله عبر العراق ووصلت الى سمرقند اعجبني هذا يعني هذا اثر فيه تماما يعني هذا اعتبرت هذا هو هو المسجد القيت نظره على على التفاصيل التي تعبر عن العماره البغداديه عن الخان مرجان هذا يعتبر من اهم المشاريع التي اثرت حتى في في كذا مشروع او في كذا منحه في اطار تصميم كيف اصمم الضوء كيف اشكل الضوء في داخل المسجد وكنت اعتبر الضوء هو هذا العنصر الروحي هو العنصر التاملي هو العنصر اللي فيه الصفاء ثم المسجد والسوق هذه عباره مفردات وضعتها فقط حتى اضعها امامي في الذاكره في في اثناء كيف اشكل هذا هذا الشيء يصبح شيء مادي فبدات ادخل في رحله عن ازمه التعبير عن المسجد هل هو هل هو مسجد؟ هذه طبعا من الاشياء اللي في في الحضاره العباسيه موجوده ومنها في كمان في ايران فهنا في رحله طويله حول كيف انظر المسجد هل هو قبه؟ هل هو فراغ؟ هل هو كتله؟ لان يعني عمري ما صمت مسجد في حياتي هذه كانت اول بداياتي وهذه كانت مسابقه عالميه دخل فيها فينتوري سكوت براون وبوفيل وكما في معماري ياباني معروف وبعدين دخل فيها من اليابان اعتقد معاذ العروس طبعا معاذ العروسي وبعدين دخل فيها كمان قحطان المدفعي ودخل فيها مكيه وهنا التقيت بمعاذ يعني هنا كانت لقاء سنه 79 حتى كنت انظر للداخل ما هو الداخل كيف انظر للداخل وكنت متاثرا بما رايته بخان مرجان كيف كيف اتعامل مع الضوء اعتبرت هذه ابداع يعني يجب ان ان اضع في 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 ذاكرتي ثم بدات افكر في في الخارج ما هو الخارج ما هو الخلاف الخارجي يمكن جامع سمراء شدني في تكرار العناصر يعني انا بحاول ان ادخل عن هذا النظام الرياضي دائما كان في فكره حول القبه ما هي القبه هل هي تؤدي 
القبة كانت في المساج تؤدي دور الصوت الأكوستيك خاصة عند المحراب بعدين تحولت إلى نظام كيف تتعمم مع الفرغات الضخمة من غير أعمدة ودخلت في بعض التفاصيل فهذا عبارة عن سميها عبارة عن عن يعني زي كتابات مختصرة أو سكتشية عن كيف أنظر للجامع في إطار في إطار التكوين أو في إطار التشكيل وبدأت شوي شوي أدخل لفكرة الجامع في سامراء هذا المربع المحكم فهذا هذا اعطاني اعطاني او شيء اعتبرت هذا هذا العمل تايمليس يعني المربع عباره عن عن شكل يعني يعني يتخطى الزمن وبدات اتعامل مع الموقع، الموقع هو عباره عن عن احد الحدائق الكبيره في في بغداد، حاولت اتعامل في اطار السياق، كيف اربط الجامع مع الارض ومقومات الارض وكان في النص في زي روتندا كبيرة دائرية زي ساحة دائرية حاولت أتعامل معها تكون جزء من المشروع إنه إنه الأرض لها تاريخ ولها لها دي إن إيه ولها يعني مقومات زمنية حاول أنا هذه المقومات لا ألغيها ثم ثم أعيد تأكيدها من خلال المشروع كمان في نقطة أخرى هذا القصر العباسي أنا كثير عجبني المحاور بقى كنت أقول إنه المشروع نفسه فيه تأثير من من ال من ال نظام المنتظم للجامع لكن الشيء اللي اللي اعطى للمشروع هذا قيمه انه اه هلا الجامع حبيت بس اعبر عنه انه هو عباره عن عن مساجد عباره عن مصليات وكل مصلى عباره عن 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 وحده كامله ممكن الناس يستعملوا فقط هذه الوحده وبينها ما رايته في خان مرجان اللي هي عناصر الاناره على فكره هذا الشيء ضل في الذاكره عندي الى يومنا هذا في مشايخ اخرى ح ح يعني حاعرضها بشكل سريع انه كيف هذا كان هاجس كنت عاود اشوف كيف اتعامل معه في في الواقع وليس في سكتش طبعا كان في مجال للمرح انه شو هي الفتحه هي فتحه ولا هي حفره ولا هي عباره عن غلاف كنت عم بحاول اعمل غلاف ورا غلاف يعني تكون الفتحه عباره عن اناره اندايركت للقوس بس ما يكون القوس هو 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 الواجهه الرئيسيه بعدين الشيء الاخر اللي اهتميت فيه هو ان اضع المسجد انه هو كانه في مدينه فمدخل المسجد يتم من خلال ازقه تؤدي الى 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 المحلات او الـ او او نسميها الشوبينج او الى المياضئ حتى حتى كمان الجزء هذا المائل ذكرني بالحدائق المعلقه ب هي كانها مصاطب زراعيه وتحت في الخدمات تعطي المسجد تدرج وهنا ياتي التاثير سامراء اللي هي الاجزاء المتكرره. هنا انا بقول كيف رحت المسجد هي عباره عن مدينه ادخلها لا اجابه امامي هذا البناء الصالح الضخم فخلقت المسجد مدينه من خلال قاعات الصلاه كانها مدينه صغيره كانها ايربن فابريك. وضعنا ايضا فكره ان يكون هناك في مصلى يومي بهذه الزاويه فهذه كانت اول اول بدايات التفكير حول ان هي عباره عن شبه مدينه اوكي اوف اوف يا قد يا طيب اوكي طيب يعني ما كنت اتصور طيب ما تخبش هذا هو المسجد هذا هو ال حتى اللون له علاقه باللون التركوازي هو جزء من 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 بيئه الحضاره العباسيه وحتى بتنجد في ايران فهي عباره عن مدينه والمدينه تتفاعل مع العناصر فهي عباره عن جزئين هذا هذا مشروع هو ادخلني للرياض هو ادخلني لجامع الكبير في الرياض حتى اهم شيء فيه بشكل سريع هي منطقه صحراويه مناخيا تشبه بغداد فهذا هو المسجد الكبير الحاز عجائز الاخان وهذا قصر الحكم مقر الامير سلمان سابقا للملك السعوديه هذا مشروع اضفت عليه انه غلاف اوربن اللي هو الغلاف الخارجي هذا المحيط بالمسجد انا عملت فايليشن للتي او ار انا خالفت المسابقه وحاولت انا اقرا هذه صور للرياض القديمه قبل سنه 1912 كيف اقرا هذه الرساله وحولها الى رساله عمرانيه 
هذا المشروع غير من من نمط المدينه، غير من حياه المدينه، فهون هون ياتي دور العماره كيف تكون مؤثر فاعل وليس رد فعل، هذا كثير مهم. هذه مجموعه دراسات سكتشات بلاش هلا اني يعني اشرحها بس يمكن تحكي عن نفسها كنت ابحث عن تاريخ المكان، عماره نجديه وكيف اعبر عنها في في اطار تقني الغلاف الخارجي، الغلاف الاجتماعي، الغلاف اللي بنسميه احنا السياقي، علاقه المسجد مع المحيط العمراني القائم. كيف ابحث عن منظومه التكوين، منظومه اللي بسميها التصنيع. نظام المناخي هذا كثير مهم، هذا يعتبر من اهم هو يعتبر اكثر مسجد في في السعوديه اقل كلفه في في تكييفه، هذا يعتبر كمان احد احد الفوائد التي انتجت هذا النظام المناخي. وهذا هو من الداخل. هذا غلاف العمراني هي مدينة وهذا قصر الحكم مقر الأمير سلمان مكان أمير الرياض. بس عاوز أحط أنا من هذا المشروع كان في أخطاء أنا شعرت فيها، حاولت أعبر عنها في مشروع آخر قروي اللي هو هذا الجامع، هنا أقرب نحن إلى خان مرجان، هنا صارت الإنارة بين 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 الفتحات من السقف. كان جدا مكلف بس الحلو فيه انه هذا الضوء يتغير اثناء النهار. فهنا وجدت في مقاربه في في جدل في في حوار بين الخان مرجان من خلال فن تصميم الضوء الشمسي. مشروع اخر مهم يعتبر هو الان الـ الـ يعني زي ما بسميها فيري بوبولار بالسعوديه هو تطوير درعيه مطلوب عمل متحف عن الفن الاسلامي وتاريخ الاسلام. فهذا كان احد اجزاء التطوير انه اعمل هذا المتحف، المتحف المفروض كان بناؤه عباره عن اربع ادوار، انا رحت نزلته بالارض بحيث يراعي يراعي المدينه القديمه اللي نشا فيها ال سعود اللي هي الطريف. فاصبح هنا علاقه بين بين هذا الجزء والجزء الاخر. كانه نسيج ارضي تفاعل وتحول الى 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 واصبح هذا من اهم المشاريع اللي نشات في 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 السعوديه وهو الوحيد المشروع الوحيد في العالم العربي الذي يصبح سطحه هو هو الوجه الخامسة والآن تحول إلى وزارة ثقافة يعني تخيل إنه هالبناء تحته في وزارة هذا كثير مهم حب حبيت بس أعمل رسالة إنه ماذا كيف ما هو الجيل أنتم جيلكم كيف ممكن أن نتعامل مع هذا الجيل كيف ممكن نعمل حوار مع هذا الجيل من خلال المهندس جمال بدران اللي هو كمان أيضا شارك في مشاريع مهمة جدا حب بس أرضه بشكل سريع أوكي يا خلاص أولا كان مشروع المسابقة الأوروبية لتصميم مركز إسلامي في جراتس في في النمسا هذا مشروع حاز على الجائزة لكن لم ينفذ لأنه تخطى الكلفة المتوقعة له هذه دراسة تشك تظهر جراتس كبيئة جبلية كيف تعاون إحنا مع الجبل والأسطح بحيث أسطح المشروع نفسه تحول إلى إلى أسطح ممكن الإنسان أن يسير فوقها هي أسطح تذكرنا أيضا بالمقرنص كنت عم بقارن بين المدينة العربية انه اسطحها شكل مقرنص هندسي والمدينة الاوروبية فيها كمان هذه التكسيرات في السقف. بعدين التحول بين بين اتجاه الكنيسة واتجاه المسجد هذه اللي هو السكتش هذا منه تحول الى 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 المقرنص. نعم خلاص اوكي. هذا المشروع والبلدية حطته كايكون هنا ممكن تكون ايكون لبلدية كراس بس للاسف كلفته كانت 40% اكثر من المتوقع. المشروع الاخير فقط عاوز انا احطه لان هذا كثير مهم ايضا شغل جمال هو المتحف الاثري في دبي واللي كان يعني مفاجئ انه كيف تعامل مع متحف بهذه الصياغه. في منطقه يعاد اعاده بناء التاريخ دبي الطيني الابيوز الطينيه بحيث يصبح المتحف سطحه تخترقه تحول الى مدينه او تصير على اسطحه وترى من سطح من خلاله بعض المعروضات في 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 داخله فهذا كان من 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 المشاريع اللي اللي كانت جدا مهمه وإلى علاقه كمان الى صد قصي علاقته مع الطبيعه علاقته مع الماء والرمل واليابسه والماء واعتقد هذا هو حبيت ان التزم بالوقت اوكي هذا خلص وهذا هذا هو اللي مساء الخير بتكون بالعربي ولا بالانجليزي؟ لا 
شو انجليزي خلاص لا انجليزي خلاص ما يصير حاولنا حاولنا حكم حكم غير ديمقراطي طيب اولا اي لايك تو ثانك ايفريبدي هو ميد ات هير توداي اي اولسو وونت تو ثانك اي ثينك وليد بيفور اي ستارت ثانك يو سو ماتش فور هيلبينج وذ اول ذا برزنتيشنز از ويل يو ار ريلي فيري هيلبفل ويل جامب رايت انتو ات ويل هاف ون اور Uh, for Q and A, I don't want to monopolize the time. I want to give you guys the time, but I'll start maybe with one question per each panelist, and then we'll jump right to your questions. Make sure that your questions are questions and not statements, because I will cut you off. You'll have less than 10 seconds to ask a question, and I would ask you to keep your your answers to under one minute. Um, maybe I'll begin with Mr. Uh, Mr. Walid. Mr. Walid, uh, we saw beautiful pictures uh, that you showed of uh, of your uh, of your project, uh, Basuna. Is that right, Basuna? So Basuna is a, a, a fantastic project. But what was interesting about it for me was that I saw that you were quite involved with the project. You were really in there, not just as an architect, but it looks like you had acquired some some craft, some skills. You were, I think, part of the team that was building the project. So my question to you is, how important is it for an architect to have such skills uh, that you know we generally we don't see architects doing, especially now with these giant architectural firms? It's more or, more or less sort of a separated um, involvement or a, an aloof involvement. So can you tell us? Uh, do you think architects should have these practical skills? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your question. Absolutely, I believe so. And this is what I do, not just in this project, but uh, in every project. It's uh, My practice is a design build. And uh, uh, the, it was first uh, prompted by uh, a failed project that I had put so much effort into uh, in terms of design. But then when it was constructed, the contractor really ruined it so i i from that moment on i was like i need to uh, build what i design and that of course uh, was confirmed because of the problems the technical problems on site uh, informed me once i was back on the drawing table in the next project so yes i i do that in every project at least i mean there's certain ones like the maison d'egypte in paris Obviously, that's another process and a bigger uh, building, and there were other complications. But generally, yes, I, I'd like to do that. And and we have someone like of Arab, for instance, and the, and the idea of total design and all of that. Yes, so I believe in that very much, okay. and it really does uh, um, inform my design process from the very beginning. Okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you for keeping the, the answers brief as well, so I can ask you another question in a minute, uh, Shahira. Uh, I have so many questions for you, but I think one question I would ask and uh, is, I'm sorry to ask you this question, but I feel like I have to ask you. This is, uh, this is a room that I think the audience is 50-50, male, female, but in reality, this is a panel that's four men and one woman. And I want to ask you, what about the, uh, you know, what about your role when it comes to being a pioneer, a trailblazer uh, in architecture in the region? Uh, in the region? Unfortunately, even, even in the West, uh, but architecture is seen as a very male-dominated um, uh, sort of uh, field, and I'd like to say, I'd like to ask you, how do you feel about it? How do you navigate this field? Do you feel that there is a discrimination against women? Um, I mean, you have so much to say, and I'll let you speak. Thank you, Sultan. <clears throat> so, you know, when I started, uh, this is very strange to say, but actually, when I started young. Uh, I didn't, maybe I didn't have the awareness. I didn't put it in my mind that I'm a woman in a, in a men's field. So I, I was just working and things were going actually openly and, and much more easier than today. I don't know why, but yeah. It was easier being younger, uh, navigating this field. Um, uh, in my office, uh, there were actually, I had this observation from one of my clients who came in and said, uh, are you a feminist? This is 70% women architects in your office and 30 only uh, men. And I I wasn't actually aware I'm doing so, actually. And uh, I was just more comfortable working with women architects. Uh, they were more dedicated, they were faster, and they were, you know, they, had, they knew they had limited time because a lot of them were mothers or, uh, you know, or g getting engaged or something. So... Anyway, and, and that worked. Uh, later, 
uh, I just started maybe become uh, to become aware of it. And it became much more difficult uh, in sites and with clients. Yeah, I started seeing that more. I, uh, I'm trying to reflect on it. Like why in my 40s it's harder being a woman architect than being in my 20s and 30s. And of course, you know, during construction work and working with contractors, you feel in the beginning they dismiss few things, but later when you build an experience with them, you build a relationship and they start feeling, you know, uh, more comfortable. I start to, to be more comfortable and things move on, you know. Um, anyway, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I think the work that you showed, Shahira, really proves that, uh, you know, women, uh, there's no dearth, there, there's no lack of women's skills. Uh, it's, I think, unfortunately, a lot of it is to do with, the, with men uh, not believing that, uh, you know, women are uh, capable of such uh, uh, jobs. So I'm really happy uh, to, see, to have you here as well, and uh, God bless you for what you're doing. Um, Mr. Uh, Michael Wolfson, uh, I, I mean, you showed some amazing works, uh, of course, Russian constructivism, but you also showed a lot of the paintings that Zaha Hadid did. No one really thinks of Zaha Hadid as a painter, as an artist. We think of her as an architect. We think of her as an urbanist. But how important is painting as a skill for architects? Should, should architects know how to paint? Is there a skill? I'm personally interested in this. Should architects know how to paint? Is this a skill that architects should have? No, no. Is that working? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll swallow it. <laughs> Didn't, in order not to answer the question. Um, uh, well, if it, uh, whether or not a university should teach painting, I can't answer. But I think, uh, you know, so many of architecture students don't um, draw. And I think that's very important because you examine a completely different aspect of a work, and, and when I say that, I mean you're looking at space differently. Um, Zaha used paintings as, uh, it, it wasn't, I mean, it, it was a moment, you know, when she started in the 70s that that was, everyone was looking for a different way to do architecture, to try to come, get ideas across. And Zaha found it very important, and, and it was very exciting, um, because it, 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 paintings were a way of conveying this idea of what she thought architecture could be. And it was, it was very new. And yet it was very old because the constructivists, was do, the futurists were doing that. But I think Zaha abstracted it and distorted it because it, the idea was that we would really look at how a space was created. Paintings were used to convey that. Oh, that was brief. Do you, do you want to add to it? Do you, do you want to add to this? Okay. Uh, then, uh, Stad Rasim, Tahiyati. Uh, Mr. Rasim, I was asked you in, in English, and I'm hoping you answer in English. Is that right, Ahmed? No, I will answer in Arabic. Very well. Yeah. I, mean, I tried. Sorry, I mean. I, I tried. <laughs> okay. So, if I'm going to ask you in English. I'm going to ask you in Arabic. I'm going to ask you in English. 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 I'm going to ask you هذا الداخلي بلغتي أيه. شفت أيه. مثلا حتى الخط العربي أيه. فيه فيه في قراءات وفي فيه جماليات طب ليش ليش ننساها أيه. كيف خاصة إنه الغرب يعني أعتقد أنكم أيه. طيب. تحبوا أحكي بالألماني أو بالإنجليزي لا أيه. طب خلص الوقت خلص ها <تصفيق> طيب أوكي okay, I, I will maybe I will put some phrases in English أيه. or طيب. German if you want so مش so. بس أو ده إن عربي so my, my question to uh, Mr. Rasim Badran yeah. as uh, somebody who has been following uh, architecture in the region and participated in the uh, architecture of the Gulf for the past uh, 30, 40 years is, um, how do you assess the projects in the Gulf? I'm sure you're following the projects in the Gulf. A lot of projects are awarded uh, to architects from all over the world. What uh. do you think? What do you, I mean, I want to know your opinion. What do you think of these projects that are announced in the Gulf 
the glass skyscrapers and uh, do you think these are appropriate for our climate? Do you think you know, these I, don't, I don't want to lose my clients. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how would you advise them to adapt? What would you like to see more of? Well, I, I let you I tell you something. I mean, we uh, Jamal was working in a project and I worked with him a bit. It's, it's a new city between Dubai and Abu Dhabi. And you know what he told me? We get fed up from Dubai, Abu Dhabi. Why you don't create a human city? Jawal Qasr. I mean, it's, it's a, so it's a, they call it the Riviera. And I think in that project, we spend most of our time how we, how we define the public space, the space which you mentioned, the gray area, how we can create a, a meaningful a, a, a home to live in the out, as if it's a, it's a home for you. Yeah. Because usually in modern architecture, no, nobody cares for, 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 for the, what happens around this building. You put this uh, signature, okay, and what happens in the, in the, in the zero level? Nothing. What I care for it, and okay, you have your own private space, but why we don't create a public space which has become also private for the public? Mm -hmm. As if it's a home without, without roof. So designing the, the, the sky of the city is the most difficult thing, and many people, they, they, they couldn't master it. So we, uh, Jamal and myself, we, we enjoy, we spend time. You know, the project has, has I think, they give, a, give us four months, we spend two years just to design the open space. So you create a narrative, you create a story. Usually in our city, there's no story. So I think this is actually the value of, of how you create a, a meaningful fabric, a fabric, when we showed the Dubai, um, uh, museum, or uh, we we create a dialogue between the water and al yabisa the hard يعني, land and water. How we create, and when you cook, when you look in Google in the Gulf region, you find, يعني معجزات في الطبيعة علاقة الماء والأرض إشي هي بحدة عمارة. So we this has inspired us how we create this kind of uh, to think in context that water become also a mass. You have to. To, uh, to uh, dialogue water. Uh, and I think, as uh, uh, Maad told me, speak about this experience. And I think this museum represents how we envision water and, and, uh, and, uh, and land. But the time was too short. We can, we can, sp uh, we can talk about uh, hours and hours. نشرح فكرة علاقة الماء والأرض. أو علاقة الصحراء وال... يعني... شكرا لك. شكرا سادة. شكرا جزيلا. Uh, so I, I, I uh, now, now, yeah. Now there's another another thing which we are which we worked in the area. It's a, a shiab, uh -huh. and I think this need a, a, a lecture in the area. How we create from the shiab a city, which uh, which is uh, in harmony with 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 that. Uh, magnificent nature, I mean. Fantastic idea. I, I think this is a good idea for Ahmed. I'll take a question from the audience now. Uh, I will take two or three questions from the audience. So put your hand up if you have a question. There's someone in the front here. I will collect three questions and then we'll ask who the... Uh, will, um, so just in, introduce yourself and your question and no statements, please. So Tfadl Sadri Giddam. Do you have a mic for him? You can ask your question and Tfadl. Okay. بس رجاء السؤال فقط. ضافر معن. How many panels we can ask? <laughs> you can ask one one person. One person. Okay, yeah. so I'll go for Shahira. Uh, I I would like Shahira you to uh, to highlight the the relation or the synergy between the design intent and the constructed executed work. Uh, I th you, you, you did make it very, you make it very clear actually that you feel more comfortable home with the small scale, the product design, but then you have the finished work. So well, what's your, usually what we teaching universities, uh, teaching, teaching students the design intent, and then they go and they get a shock in the, in the, to, uh, to, to make a built environment. You see, sometimes you want to go away from the MEP and the construction and structure, and you're more comfortable in the product design. So what's... Thank you, beautiful. Thank you. The first question is Shahira. The second question is Shahira. There's another question in the middle. Here, Anissa is sitting. And the third one is here. Wait, just a second. Shahira, the first question is for you. 
اوكي لا استنى بس مرحبا انا المهندس رنوى الخطيب سؤالي لمهندس عرفه إيه؟ بالنسبه للجامع الانبوت تبع let me say it in english i would like to know the input of the locals whether in the option in the design itself their interaction uh, the skilled labor whether they were, they were involved or not and who the client was is it a local client or it's a public thing this is a great question Thank you. Uh, we'll take one last one and then we'll go to the uh, anyone here there's a gentleman بعيد حضرتك طيب اوكي ممكن تروح للاخ اللي هناك وين ده في ارفع ايدك طيب شهيره فيك تبدي انت لانه بعيد يا اخي أنا طبعا يعني البرودكت ديزاين اكشلي كان حاجات ان بتوين البروجكتس الكبيرة سو لما بيبقى في وقت في فراغ الواحد بيخش يعمل برودكت ديزاين بس a lot of the projects uh, to start I actually had to implement my own projects زي uh, وليد لما ابتدى في المشروع اضطر هو يخش بدل ما اول أنا عملت حاجات مقاولات في الأول عشان to make sure that my drawings are are built and correctly and then I did it for a few projects and then I uh, decided لا, I have to stop I will supervise I will now I gain some credibility so I can actually supervise the contractor uh, deliver construction documents make sure the uh, design is is being built and um, And uh, this has been done. Yeah, I've been I've built a part of Alegria, which is like 400 units residential. Uh, so you can do work with supervisions, and you have to like uh, make sure. Like this is one of the uh, very important thing. Yeah, you have to always make sure that you deliver what you have drawn, and it doesn't you know stay in in your drawer or in your office as papers. Um, yeah, and. Uh, Uh, quick, uh, there was a client, and he was from. The, he's originally from the village, a prominent Azhari scholar, Dr. Usam Al Azhari, uh, who provided most of the funding for the project, and the people were involved in many different ways. So, at the beginning, for instance, I because I was building myself, but even before the building, the design process started, I was, uh, I went there and I spoke with the people and understood their needs and their requirements. Of course, I did that with a critical. I as well, because sometimes I'm, I'm from Upper Egypt myself. I'm born in the States, but I'm from Upper Egypt. So there's this uh, huh? sometimes which can like they wanted to do 70 meter high minaret in a, in a village that had no not a single minaret, for instance. So some, some of the things you needed to, um, yes, to walk them out of it gently, though. Uh, and of course, I was there on site almost every day. So The in, their involvement and feedback was uh, day to day. So yes, I would say they were very much involved. And uh, the skilled labor. Uh, what uh, happened here when you see the dome, there's no precedent for such a dome, for instance. So I, I had to devise this guide to use whatever skill they already, already had and bridge that and bring it to the new result. But yes, of course, a lot of workers Uh, came from the village, but uh, others came from 400 uh, kilometers away from it, like from Aswan or from Cairo. But uh, yes, thank you. Shukran, Sadi Walid. Tafadhal, Sadi. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead. Dr. Ahmed Abdel Al, from the Iraq. Sawali la Ustad Rasim. Bil haqiqa, shukran jazeel al muhabara al qayma. And Sawali huwa mudinna في أغلب المدن العربية القديمة بدأت تنزف وتخسر نسيجها التقليدي من الساكنين وغيره. فحضرتك نشوف نجا يعني نجاحات لمعماريين على مستوى أبنية مفردة لكن من أين نبدأ أستاذ راسم هل هي نبدأ من الوحدة السكنية مرة ثانية حتى نعيد الحياة إلها في رأيك ولا من بين أريد النط الفوكال بوينت أز أ بولدنج الفوكال سوشيال بوينت وذ يعني مع الناس الساكنين فبرأيك أنت من أين نبدأ شكرا أنا يمكن بحاول إنه I'm trying when when I'm talking about building I try to distract the building to become the small city. I mean, this is one 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 of the one of the approaches which I used to uh, to to uh, you know as 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 a vision. Even when I did my very early houses in in Jordan, which make make me uh, uh, maybe a bit well known in the in the European media, 
most of these houses, they become micro cities. Instead of having a box, you create a small city by having courtyards, different courtyards. And even when you look to the Bayt or Dar, Taqlidiya, traditional Dar, it's like a micro city. You have the courtyards for the men, courtyards for, for the servants, courtyards for, for, the, for the women. So this dialogue between the in and out is very important. And I think here you start creating this micro city and it can spread to become the macro city. So um, even if, if I have a single building, I can, uh, by uh, you create what they call it a, a micro urban fabric. Even when you talk about, about office building, usually you try to, to, um, to split the building, become like, like a small city, not as, as a tower. So it's, it's a, the, the, the proportion between in and out, because in our cities, we, we, we lift the outdoor. Even we live in the, in the roof of the, of the building, as in Baghdad and, and, and Aleppo. So that's why I think the building become uh, not just a, a cell, it become a motor, more interactive with the, with, the, with the cosmic order, with the, with the nature, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, with and the, um, this series of, of public open spaces which become private, and then it can transform itself in the, in the edge to become a, 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 in public spaces. So I think it's, um, even when you are dealing with a, with a, with a, with a small uh, cell, it can spread itself a bit, and you create this kind of, um, See now, I would just want to know your opinion on um, big firms, uh, big architectural firms, uh, leading in terms of like, especially in the Gulf region, in terms of building all the cultural and contemporary centers, like OMA and um, Jean Nouvel and Snowetta. So, how do you feel that the fact that there is less firms from the global south representing, uh, in particularly the Gulf region? Sorry, less firms from where? The global south. Which is so, Manasa region, eh? Manasa, Manasa, Manasa. Um, well, it depends on the firms. I mean, you, you know, if that's a reason to have a competition, isn't it? If you have an international competition, it's open to anyone. Um, that's how Zaha got started. I mean, I think that's how a lot of architects get started. Um, I think a lot of those star architect uh, buildings, if they're commissioned, well, you know, I think we're getting to a turning point now where the star architecture is not necessarily what's necessarily wanted or needed everywhere. But you do need to create something iconic. I mean, that's what was really wonderful about the Bargil, um, you know, Foundation's program for the, for the Rifatjeriji Prize, was that they wanted something that was iconic, yet it was also to blend in with, you know, traditional values. So... Yeah, star architecture has its values and it has its um, detriments. So if, if, if I were just to comment on, on the iconic, I think the iconic can be how far I this building can interact with the social. Yeah. Yeah. It's become part of this icon. It's not the form, it's the social values. I mean, this I think... Uh, yeah, I mean, now, there are some projects, but I can't talk about it. Jamal designed it. Uh, the icon of it is that it's not a project, it's something else. And this, I hope that once we can publish it, but not now. <laughs> and my, my question to Mr. Wolfson. I'm sure you noticed that the colleagues on the platform, they all worked and they started their work with the urban context or even the rural context and the villages. Now I come to Zaha and you. Do you think the urban context has anything to do with your buildings, number one? 
the urban context. I mean, like Aleph came from the sky into one of the oldest cities in the area, or uh, Russian constructivism. It has nothing to do with Russian, with Tatalin or El or a lot of work has not to do. I, you know, I knew Zaha very well since she was a kid. Uh, when we met, and you know, I was working on projects, she told me that you are crazy to follow what the neighborhood is. Is it your buildings? Well, I'm going to put it, unfortunately, sorry to say it, mannerism only, or do, to do monument only, has nothing to do with the city itself, like what the three colleagues did. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I should say that when I left Zaha's office, the first building was just started, and that was the social housing project in Berlin. So it had very much to do with the surroundings. It had very much to do with social affordability. Um, the office changed. I was in and out for the next 10 years. I worked on the Cincinnati project, which again was a very, um, a project that was very much adapted to the city. Now, I have not worked with Zaha's office in the last uh, 15 years. So I'm not involved. I think that the current um, work has taken on a slightly different direction. Um, uh, so I don't think that it's right that you, that, you, that you ignore the context. And Zaha never thought it was right to ignore the context. Um, and that's one thing that it, the constructivist paintings, the futurist paintings, all the, that work, that was there only as an impetus to the design, but it wasn't the only thing about the design. There was never a project that, I mean, her, her bridge across the town, I mean, that was a student project. But none of the work, w the program was the most important aspect of any of the projects we worked on, and how that program could be changed, could work with the community. Um, we pissed off a lot of developers because we, especially with some of the German projects, because we opened up a lot of the ground floor areas completely to public use. A lot of the early projects that were not built were, were, were completely um, integrated. I hope that answers your... I can't claim to know Zaha because I've never met her. You definitely know her more than I do. But when you say this sentence, I think I understand it in a different light, which is f um, interacting with the context is not necessarily following. So sometimes if you... Exactly. So it might be crazy to follow what's in the neighborhood if, it's, if it doesn't make sense. But respond to it, maybe sometimes ignoring is a response. Or... Exactly, yeah. نقدر رائع. تفضل الاستاذ جدام. راح اسال سؤالين بس بسرعه. سؤال واحد. بلك تسمح لي. لا سؤال واحد. او واقف. سؤال واحد او لا. عندك سؤال <تصفيق> واحد. ماشي راح مرقهم. <تصفيق> لانه لك انا غريبه ماشي مش راح نضيع الوقت. اول سؤال كثير مهم الشغل المشغول على المسجد. مهم التجريد اللي استخدمته خاصه بالمئذنه. مبين في قدرات علميه عاليه. ليش شجعت دخلت بالتفصيل بالقبه؟ القبة ليش رجعت لماذا دخلت بالتفصيل لا دكتور لا دكتور ما ليش اسمح لي راسم لا لا دكتور راسم لا 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 أنا 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 محاور هنا سؤال واحد لا أنا آسف هجاوب حضرتك بالعربي أحسن تمام لأنه أنا مش بعتقد أن التجديد يعني لما بنبص على التجديد في نظري أنه لازم نميز ما بين المطلق والثابت في أشياء في نظري مطلقة لا تتغير وفي اشياء ثابته، القبه مش مطلق ولكن في نفس الوقت لازم يكون في سبب قوي للتغيير، فالقبه حصل لها ما نستطيع ان نقول عنه انه تلقته الامه بالقبول، يعني قبه مسجد، مش شرط يكون كل قبه في مسجد، انا عامل الثيس بتاعتي على المساجد في بريطانيا، لا اعتقد ان المساجد في اوروبا مثلا المفروض يكون فيها قباب او مآذن حتى. ولكن في هذا السياق ما فيش مشكلة والتجديد هنا هو في نوع القبة وفي الوظيفة بتاعتها زي ما مثلا اتكلمنا على على المثلثات الكروية لكن مش معنى التجديد ان انا انتهي يعني مثلا الانسان لما بيعطش بيشرب مية 
بقاله من ما هو على وجه البسيطه من الاف السنين مش من باب التجديد هنبطل نشرب ميه ونشرب حاجه ثانيه فمش كل شيء التجديد فيه هو بالترك في نظري يعني متواضع بس شكرا الاخت اللي هناك السلام عليكم أه سؤالي للاستاذ بدران أه اين هي العماره الاسلاميه اليوم وما هي التحديات اللي تواجهها في خلق روحيه جديده وهل حان الوقت لخلق روحيه جديده في التصميم المعماري الاسلامي وهل للمهندس المعماري المسؤول خلاص اوكي <تصفيق> انا يمكن عندي اشكاليه اليوم كنا عم نناقش حتى مع جمال موضوع ما هي العماره الاسلاميه انا بقول انه انه ذيز اي توك اباوت اباوت عماره المجتمع الاسلامي وليس عماره اسلاميه ذيس اي ثينك وات وات اي ثينك هاز تو بي تو بي اندرستود اي توك اباوت اباوت ذا 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 بيهيفيرال فاليو اوف ذات سوسايتي as a muslim how it can reflect itself in the urban fabric in the in the in the in the in the, in the, in the figuration of, of how they can live in, within uh, within their belief i mean that's why i i always say amarat al mujtama al islami wa lisa amarat islami amarat islami okay they put it in in a in a in a geometrical pattern which can change i mean it's not it's not um, uh, it's not constant it can it can be it can be varied it can be developed but i think The most important thing, if you're talking about Islam, we're talking about about the the behavioral values, uh, the the uh, relationship between 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 uh, the family members, how they how this relationship can reflect itself in the in the in the figuration of of, of the the fabric of a house or a city, uh, and this is a very crucial point. I mean, uh, so even we talk about Amar Islamia, yeah, okay? I mean, it's. Uh, يعني I have I have here problem with with this uh, term yeah. Okay, first Qain, I want to thank you, Sultan, for a point you uh, raised and want to bring you all of us back to it. It's sketching and the painting skills. Uh, a couple of months ago, Muad saw some of my early sketches, and he advised me to publish them. So I. Uh, posted one on the uh, Facebook and to start an, a discussion. And I discovered that some of our academics are against, totally against sketching and watercoloring and uh, uh, motor skills because they think that computer aid, computer designs are here. Right, but so I ask, the yeah, panel you have a question? Is, yes, this is the question. Yeah. What does the panel think? Because we have students here. What does the panel think of painting? Of, of motor skills for school students, motor architecture skills for, and drawing. Okay, got it. Thank Na, you. Opposed to computer. As opposed to computer. Right. Great. I, I, I personally start with the manual process. And I use the computer, but I always go back to the... And I wish I could do it in the same quality you do. It's amazing. Because it's a way of thinking, not just communication. Uh, I agree. Uh, I agree. Even if you, uh, when I entered uh, architecture, actually I failed in, uh, in in painting, and I was like, you know, denied from the thing because I, I couldn't do it. But then later you train yourself, and it's a good way of developing the project. You bu you go back and forth between hand and, and computer. <laughs> um, I've always started with with sketches in the pencil, just because I'm that old. But um, I, 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 my work needs the computer, the, the, the built pieces need to be on a computer. And I, I have a process, I don't know if you, there was a sketch for the line desk, which did start as a pencil. And then I usually take that to a few other sketches on paper, and then I'll work with one of my um, computer capable people. Um, but I don't just give them the sketch. I actually will sort of sit with them in front of the screen and will you will then use the screen as a drawing tool. Uh, with certain programs, so he'll interpret the sketch as he can, and then we'll develop it from that. So it's not fixed when it gets on the computer. We actually push and pull and, and turn and, 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 and model. And, and, and then, um, so it, it, it's, it's, it certainly can go hand in hand, but I think it's so important to be able to use the pencil. And your sketches are. I hold this pencil. You know, the, the يعني, shell, il, il, terrifying me when I see people uh, um, this, this, the, my, my grand nephew I am, I am now teaching him he's three years old I teach him how, how, how he can hold the, uh, the pen uh, not uh, yeah, if there's, there's a, there's a uh, I don't know a flower so that's why I think 
when you teach kids to 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 hold the pens in in the in the right manner, then they can start uh, fig figure the square and and the circle and the triangle. And um, if they had, if they are, uh, uh, يعني, if someone are holding it in this manner, they will never. I mean, so that's why I think it comes by very early growth of of, of the of the kid how how he can be at, and he guided to to deal with this as 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 a, as a and how he hold it. And I think the computer for me is not just is to build the the the. The sketch idea to be built in computer, but not to be created through computer. This will never, you know. I once I, I met uh, uh, Frank uh, Liebeskind in, in Munich. It, it was a big, uh, yeah. yeah. And we've been both talking about sketching. You know, he he told me, Rasim, you know what way I do? I can't work without sketching. Even when when did I did uh, and Jamal did the the uh, the uh, development of the Abel fabric, it was sketching, 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 and we enjoy it, not by, by using computer. It's so, I mean, uh, if you want to build it, you build it in computer, but the idea between brain and soul, it becomes through hand. Please, yani, you know, in, in Germany, when, when, when we enter the Faculty of Architecture, there's an exam called Begabung uh, Briefung, with that man, with that man um, yani, gifted uh, uh, exam. How are, how, how are you gifted in, in the level of how you can express yourself through your pen? And they choose from 400 uh, students only 30, which are which are up, uh, uh, qualified to to be to be. Uh, and even in, in the lessons, when when we've been working in the in the, in the uh, getting courses, it was the free hand. The free hand was the most important. Colors. <laughs> now you know, just listening to our uh, to our universities here. I mean, haram, haram. talib haram. Uh, sorry, so I have to say it. Because it comes from your heck. It's a feeling. Rasim Bedran, Michael Wolfson, Shahira Fahmi, Walid Arafa, thank you very much and thank you for joining us. Could you be seated, please, uh, until we, uh, please, could you stay? We still have a few minutes more. لو سمحتوا بس استنوا شوي. And now, I would like to invite the head of architecture division in Jordan Engineering Association, architect Ahmed Siam, and architect Usaid Al Aytan, Tamayyuz Middle East coordinator, to hand the honorable shields to our speakers. We would like to start with Dr. Rasim Badran. Please welcome to the stage. Dr. Rasim Badran, please welcome to the stage. Mr. Sultan Al Qasimi. <laughs> Architect Shahira Fahmi. Thank you. 
أركيتكت وليد عرفة And lastly, Mr. Philip Michael Wilson. <laughs> 